Mr. Robinson in Washington and Mr. Mbeki in London, thank you for coming in to talk with us. Mr. Mbeki, by the way, you're in London. Were, yes, you, were you in South Africa, you would not be, be allowed to talk to us by satellite, would you? And that, that is certainly correct. Well, all right. Now, tell me this. The acting director, Oliver Tambo, ac acting director of the African National Congress, your organization, predicted there, unless things change quickly, there's going to be a bloodbath in South Africa which may be a reasonable prediction, but if there is a bloodbath, when it is over, what is going to be changed? Well, the, the African National Congress is saying that uh, what we need in South Africa is a, a non-racial and democratic society. Th that is what the conflict is about. The, the issues that Luinel was talking about, he was avoiding evading the central question of the South African conflict, which is the need to transform South Africa into a normal, ordinary, democratic South Africa. And in the, at the end of that conflict, that's what we'd like to see. Black and white South Africans living together as fellow citizens and as equals. Well, Mr. Nell, whom we just had on, um, could you hear him? You heard him. Yes, I heard said him. The, uh, said they are for ending apartheid but said they can't end it until the violence in the black community stops. What's, what is the answer to that? I, I think it's necessary to distinguish between cause and effect. There is violence, clearly we've seen it all, all the time. The cause of the violence, the cause of the violence is the continuation of the apartheid system. There is nothing that has changed in the apartheid system which, which would indicate what Nell is saying that it is correct that his regime is committed to change. It is not addressing the fundamental and basic question of the right and the possibility of all South Africans to live together, to vote together, to, to participate in the formation of a non-racial government. The conflict will therefore continue so long as that issue is not addressed. Mr. Robinson, for, pretend for a moment you were put on South Africa, given a chance to talk to the white population there. How would you assuage the anxieties that I think they might reasonably have looking at the fate of democracy and majority rule elsewhere in black Africa? And how would you tell them that the ANC, which seems to be committed to violence, is in fact a democratic reform movement and that life would be still pleasant for them in South Africa after the dismantling of apartheid? How could you convince them of this? The African National Congress for 48 years p pursued a nonviolent course. Uh, and with no result. Only in 1960 did the African National Congress turn to a program of armed resistance. Over the last two years in the struggle, some 1,700 blacks have died in South Africa, only 12 whites. So that it is a government that uh, is bent on a course of violence, not the African National Congress. The African National Congress wants one person, one vote in a democratic society. I think we would be well to look at Zimbabwe as an example. The Western powers imposed sanctions, and those sanctions coupled uh, with a war in Zimbabwe uh, persuaded Ian Smith and the whites in that country that the best option available to them was to proceed to the negotiation table and negotiate towards a democratic society. It is working. Whites are returning to Zimbabwe. It would work in South Africa, but if pressed, if blacks have no other alternative, then we will see a bloodbath in that country. And as long as whites have uh, no reason, uh, as long as they, 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 they are not pressed to negotiate, they won't. As long as we, as a nation, continue to supply them with 40% uh, of their oil and 50% of their computers and 30% of their vehicles and loans and investments, as long as the Western powers continue to prop up and diplomatically endorse uh, the white community, uh, then that uh, government is not going to negotiate and we're going to head towards, uh, towards a terrible situation in South Africa. Mr. Mbaki, the American public over the last 20 years or so has seen a number of third world movements, the Sandinistas in Nicaragua, the Castro movement in Cuba, the Viet Cong, advertise themselves before they get to power as democratic agrarian reformers committed to pluralism and all that only to turn around and have them plant just another dictatorship. Why should the American public believe that your movement is any different? We, we are saying that 
it is necessary for all South Africans who are interested in the emergence of a peaceful and prosperous society. It is necessary that all those South Africans should participate together in the struggle to ensure that that kind of South Africa is born. We are saying, therefore, that white South African businessmen, white church people, Africaners included, ought to be involved in the struggle for the birth of that kind of society. But, sir, and if I... By their, by their participation, by their participation, they put themselves in a position to influence the resolution of the question, what kind of South Africa we should have. But where does the ANC stand on what Mr. Nell was talking about, the killing of moderate blacks by, he says, extremist blacks that's taking place there now? Does your group denounce that and disassociate itself from it? The violence, the violence that you see in South Africa today is the violence that emanates from the apartheid system. And so long as you have apartheid, so long will you have violence. That, that, that is the basic fundamental thing. That is the cause. But do you, my, do you my, dissociate yourself from the killing of blacks by blacks that Mr. Nell is talking about? In, in a situation where the ANC has said it is necessary to take up arms, <coughs> as, as Randall said, after many decades of trying out a peaceful struggle. May I comment on that, Mr. Will? Sure. Uh, the crossroads situation is not uh, at all like uh, Mr. Nell described. Uh, the crossroads situation, where blacks have killed blacks, we have found conservative blacks collaborating with the government, uh, taking instruction from police on the site, armed by police, uh, to, uh, to attack anti-apartheid uh, forces in crossroads. All of the shanties that have been burned down have been shanties of the anti-apartheid community. The shanties that remain standing are those uh, of, uh, lived in by those who support the government, armed by the government, instructed by the government. So Mr. Nell cannot disassociate the South African government from the tragedy of Crossroads. The government is uh, responsible for that. Mr. Mbeki, some members of your leadership, Mr. Mbeki, some members of your leadership are members of the Communist Party. You're Secretary General, for one. How can you assure Americans that what you won't put into place is another communist system? Let, let me just complete what, what Randall was saying just now. You well, see, the black, Mr. Mbeki, black people... excuse me, sir. Would you answer my question about communist membership yes, by your leadership? Yes, sir, sir, they sir, are sir, communists, are they not? Certainly, I'm going to answer that question. Yes, certainly, they are communists. The ANC has said all the time that it is a national liberation movement, and within it, it must therefore contain all the various tendencies from among the oppressed people. Well, then what assurance can you be given that you will not put in place a communist dictatorship in South Africa? But the ANC is not a communist party. Within the ANC, you have communists, you have people who have got Christian democratic views, you've got people who are Muslim, you've got people who are Christian, and all of them make together this formation, this alliance, which is saying our immediate principal task is to transform South Africa into a democratic country. Mr. And that's what the ANC is, and that's how it's called. Well, how can communism and democracy be the same thing? These systems are antithetical. But surely, say, it's not so long ago that the United States itself was in ally, in alliance with the Soviet Union to fight Nazi Germany. We don't have much of a different situation in South Africa. Mr. Mbeki, thank you very much. And Mr. Robinson, thank you both for coming in and talking with us today. Coming next, Chester Crocker, the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, in a moment. Yeah. Mr. Secretary, Mr. Crocker, thanks very much for coming in today. Good to be here. Pleased to have you with us. Now, tell us, what is our policy? You, talk, you told Congress some time ago that we favor the end of apartheid, that we see the uh, anti-apartheid forces as freedom fighters. Is all that correct? We clearly believe that the apartheid should be ended uh, as soon as possible and should give, give way to a system based on American democratic principles, we would hope, but democratic universal principles of, of equal participation for everybody, uh, protection of their freedoms, opportunity to participate in politics and so forth. We've said that all along. So what are we doing to bring it about? Not a great deal, are we? I think a point that has to be emphasized is that South Africa is not the 51st state of the Union or some small island off the coast of Florida. It is uh, a largely self-sufficient country. It is 8,000 miles away. Our influence there has always been at the margins. We're using that influence. We have our diplomacy in place there. We do have access to the various parties inside the country. 
We have an economic presence there, which we believe, in fact, is a very constructive force. I think if more Americans knew uh, what our firms are doing, the investors in South Africa, they would be proud of the role that we are playing in that country. But it is influence at the margins. We've just heard Mr. Mbaki say that the African National Congress has Democrats and Communists and Christians and all the rest. That's the way the Czech government was in 48, the Castro movement in 58, the Sandinistas in 78, but the Communists somehow seemed to win. Now, you did describe the ANC as freedom fighters in the generic meaning of that term, I think was your quote, testifying before Congress. Should Americans be alarmed or not alarmed about the nature of the ANC? The ANC is, uh, in effect, a, a coalition of different elements. It has within it, without any question, a significant number of people who are also members of the South African Communist Party. There is, without any question, uh, a degree of Soviet influence inside that movement. Do we have any influence within that movement? I think we have the potential. I think there are, in fact, inside the ANC, uh, a range of voices. It has got to be our purpose uh, to seek to, uh, to put people in a position where they are obliged to take real decisions and to test what they really believe well, in. For example, if I may, the ANC has committed itself to democracy and so forth, a whole series of things which I think all Americans would support. At the same time, it's committed itself to violent means. It's committed itself to, to terrorist tactics. It's committed itself in its relationship with the Soviets to a certain orientation internationally. I think these things have to be tested, and the way you test them is by having relationship or contact, at least, with, with all the key parties. I'm not quite clear what the difference is, though, between a situation such as in South Africa and the situation that our government sees in Nicaragua. We support violent means to make the Sandinista government change in Nicaragua. But you seem to be shying away from the idea that sometimes when a political system will not change, it oppresses its people, violent means are required, as in the case of South Africa. I think we have to abhor the violence used by the government against uh, the people in repressive actions. We have to abhor the violence used by terrorists. We have to abhor the violence used by the comrades and the vigilantes. I don't see much morally to choose between them in that situation. But people have no resort to violence properly against the government that oppresses them? It seems to me for us at this distance, 8,000 miles away, to call for the violent means of overthrow of the South African government is, is, a, is an appeal for, for a, a really massive bloodbath of which blacks will be the principal victim. Let's not forget the degree of coercive power that remains in the hands of the white authorities in that country and the, the white population generally. Uh, I don't think either white or black want to see a violent solution, and I don't see why we would either. The House has passed, as you know, a bill requiring not only sanctions against South Africa, but disinvestment by U.S. firms. What's the administration's position on that? Would the president veto it if the Congress sent it to him? I don't see how uh, the administration could possibly do anything but firmly oppose a bill of that kind. We believe it's important to be using our influence, including pressure. We're not against pressure. We, in fact, have a number of sanctions in place in current policy. The president adopted some additional ones last fall. And we see this situation... They're very, they're very weak, Mr. Secretary. You would admit they're very weak sanctions, would you not? I would say that what they're primarily designed to do is to send a very clear political signal. They have sent a signal. The situation is obviously not a source of satisfaction to us. What we are saying, though, <clears throat> is that we must not, in the process of trying to bring change in South Africa, assure that we bring destruction to South Africa in a form of collective punishment on all the South African the people, people. The people who follow you along your constructive engagement path say, we've done this for five years, we have a state of emergency, things we can't see measurable progress. You say, well, it's there if people could see what our investors are doing and all the rest. What could you tell people in Congress if you say don't support the House bill because in three years or five years or whatever the following will have happened. What's going to happen if, if your program succeeds? Well, we in what time frame? The time frame of course is not primarily a function of our actions but I would say that what we're seeking to support is a process of negotiation between black and white that produces a new political system. Does that mean black, uh, the ANC and the government? I wouldn't put it so simply. It has to include uh, all relevant black parties. Does the ANC is not the only one. But it does have to include the ANC. We have said that. I think that is our analysis. And is there any chance in the world, I mean, any realistic hope that the ANC is going to satisfy Mr. Nell's criterion of, of disavowing violence? That's an army, the ANC. On the, on the issue of violence, in our view, there has got to be a way to crack that nut. Both sides have been laying down preconditions uh, to each other. 
And as long as they keep doing that, it means, in our judgment, that they haven't really gotten uh, to, to a serious decision point. Secretary, why Mr. hasn't Secretary, this... one thing, Sam. Did. The other day, the House voted all these sanctions and disinvestment and so on. Let us say that General Motors were forced by law to pull out of South Africa. Japanese automobile makers are there. They would simply take over the market. What would we have accomplished? I think you've answered your own question. We would have removed our influence, uh, at, which is at the margins. You would have opened up opportunities uh, for others, assuming they would fill that vacuum, and in many cases they have. We've seen that around the world, so that's not a very effective lever. We don't have that kind of influence over South Africa. Mr. Secretary, how, how hard does this government uh, condemn or deplore the press censorship that South Africa has imposed? We think what the South African government has done in recent weeks is to shoot itself in both feet. Uh, these measures of repression, which is all that they are, uh, will not address the basic grievances and the basic problems. What they will do is try to, if you will, put a buffer between uh, our eyes and what's going on inside the townships of that country. Uh, it doesn't really fool anybody. There may be a test of strength going on uh, behind the scenes, and we'll see what the results of that are. But we have strongly deplored and condemned the press censorship and, and the bannings of political organizations and all the rest. There are two new laws that are about to be put into effect to take the place of the emergency decree, which would have apparently almost every bit of the same effect as far as giving the government, in fact, in one case, they could detain people for six months without any charges. At the moment, I think it's 14 days. What would we think of those new laws? There are more than enough means of, of, of security laws and repression existing in South Africa's current laws without all these additional measures which simply uh, get in the way of any possibility for dialogue and, and polarize the situation further. Would you condemn Mr. them? We certainly would. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Sorry, our time thank is you. up. Thanks very much for coming in today. Pleasure to have you with us. Coming next, our discussion here about what else has been happening in the world lately, and joining us will be Marianne Dolan, columnist for the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. In a moment.